couple years before the um, Siri Singh Sa passed away, he gave me a hook to translate the Siri Guru Granth Sahib into English. And since he uh, passed away a couple years ago, I think. Yeah, I, got, I had a really smart teacher because he just gave me something that's going to keep me busy for the rest of my life. <laughs> There's no such time as idle time in my world because when I'm not working, and when I'm not taking care of my house, I'm like, I have to translate the guru. Because if I die and I don't do it, he's going to be there waiting for me and asking me, what I, why didn't I do it? Um, it was a really uh, amazing experience um, two years before he passed away. Um, he, he personally worked with me on translating Jepji. And you know, Kartar and I were talking about some of the stories over lunch, and I'm not going to actually start the course talking about them. I'll throw stories in here and there as we go along. But, but the reason it's a little important to mention is that when the Sirius Singh came to the United States, he, he brought the spirit of the Gurus with him. And when he kind of saw the hippies in the late 60s and early 70s looking for an experience of consciousness, he gave them Guru Nanak's words. He just gave them Guru Nanak's words in a language that they could understand it. And over the years, he's always asked everyone in Sikh Dharma, please, please, understand the Guru in its own language. And if it takes you a whole page to translate two lines of Gurbani, take a whole page to translate two lines of Gurbani. And you know, I, I want to say up front that I'm a beginner, I'm a novice, there are tons of mistakes in what I've done, I'm sure, I have no doubt. I am just learning, and I want to apologize in advance for the, you know, this is the first time actually, you know, Kartar kind of, we had this idea, and this is the first time I'm doing like a whole course just on Jebji a day and a half. So please know I'm nervous, <laughs> and that, you know, my apologies in advance if, for any mistakes that may happen over the next day and a half. But, what, I, but I, what I'm excited about is that um, I'm, I've, I have fallen in love with Guru Nanak. And I want to share that falling in love with all of you so that maybe you can fall in love with him too. Um, so, so that said, I want to I start with a few stories about Guru Nanak. Uh, I've been reading a lot of um, McAuliffe lately. And again, you know, sometimes my mind is a little fuzzy on details. But you know, when we think about how many, how many here in this room? Is there anybody in this room? This is kind of your first exposure to Guru Nanak. You, you know, you've never really heard of him before. We're all kind of okay. Good. I just wanted to check and see. So, um, you know, I've been reading these stories about Guru Nanak and Macaulay, and it's it's written in very formal language and very thou and thy kind of language. But when you know you start reading about Guru Nanak's life, you realize. He was a pretty radical dude for his time, you know. He was not going along with the status quo. Um, there's a story about how he had such a longing for God that he just wound up in bed sick because he was, like, having such a longing for the experience of God. And he was driving his parents crazy. Okay, all of you who have children, right, if one day your child just couldn't get out of bed because they were just so in love with God and they couldn't, they couldn't stand it, right, You'd like call the doctor to find out what was wrong with them, which is what happened for Guru Nanak. His parents called the doctor and said, did you find out what's wrong with our, <laughs> with our son? He's not getting out of bed. And Guru Nanak was like, you can't cure me. I'm, I'm looking for my beloved and I can't find my beloved. Um, he loved to go hang out with all of the yogis and the not, the, not just the yogis. He loved to go find all the people who knew something about God, the, the, spiritual, the spiritual people of his day. He just wanted to hang out and talk to them and find out what their experience was and what their reality was. This drove his dad nuts. His dad just drove him crazy. So his dad was like, I'm going to get my kid to learn some business. So he put him into a business, you know, doing accounting. He just had to count money. Well, the... Punjabi word for 13, come on, what is it? Thera, right? Am I saying it right? Thera. And the word for thou or thine or yours is Thera. So when Guru Nanak got to the number 13, he just started going into bliss and going Thera, 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 Thera. You know, so he was like counting 13 over and over again because for him it wasn't the number 13. All of a sudden he was feeling the experience of the divine. And he just kept counting it, counting it. Of course, now that's driving his dad bonkers because my son needs to make a living. He can't even count numbers. He gets stuck on number 13. And uh, 
it was some story about how, you know, anyway, how in doing that, actually, there was some miracle that was happening when Gudanonic was counting 13 over and over and over again, where all of a sudden the, the wealth was just multiplying because he was blessing it, because he was in a state of love. But of course he was driving, you know, everyone around him crazy because he wasn't acting according to the social rules of the day, you know. He was in so much love that he, you know, when they did the Hindu ceremony with the thread when he was a teenager, and he was like, what the heck is this? And he broke it off and he threw away. And they're like, what are you doing? He's like, the social convention doesn't matter to me. I just want the experience of love. I just want the experience of love. Well, Guru Nanak, uh, you know, he, he, he lived a life, a human life. Uh, and one thing that the Siri Singh Sab taught us in Sikh Dharma is he said, the Guru Nanak meditated for 10,000 years in the ethers, in the heavens, before he came into form. Because his mission was that powerful, he had to meditate that deeply for 10,000 years before he became a human being. And he, he kind of, it wasn't that he was, well, some people might, let me, let me see how I can phrase this. He had to go through his own growth into his own wisdom. It wasn't like he knew everything, you know, when he, when he was a teenager, he was struggling with the reality he saw around him. Like, why do I have to get a job? Why do I have to, you know, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do that? Um, you know, when he was, you know, in his, when he got older and his parents were like, okay, maybe if we get him a wife, he'll start to settle down, you know. So he got married. He went through, you know, he, he went into the family life. But, but he was always looking for something else. He was always looking for something more. He would spend his money feeding and being with the people who were meditating and he would talk to everybody and analyze everybody and wanted to know everything. And then, I forget what age he was at again, I'm sorry, my details aren't always so clear. Uh, and then at a certain age, you know, he had his own experience of what one could call enlightenment. He had his own experience where his mind merged within his spirit. And the story goes that, you know, every morning he would get up and he would do his ishnan, he would do his morning bath, he went into the river. And one morning he went into the river and he didn't come out for three days. And of course everybody thought he was dead because he went to the river and he didn't come out. Well, he was in the water and he was just meditating. And in that experience, he, his being transformed and all of a sudden he could open up and receive the information that he had been meditating for 10,000 years in the ethers in order to bring to the earth. And when he came out of the water three days later, he sang a song. And the song he sang was Japji Sai. 10,000 years in the ethers, three days in the water, merged with God, and he sang a song. We are so used to reading things and seeing things, and um, in these forty in these forty verses of Judge Sai, we are given an understanding of human consciousness about how to live as human beings excellently on the earth and how to experience the divine. And this song is the basis of what we call Sikta, Sikh Dharma. And it's all right there. And what uh, you know, what the, one of the things when this, when the Sirius Singh Sal was talking to me about all this, what he said is he said, look, there's the mul mantra, right? The root mantra, ikum kar satnam kar kar kurit nirbal nirder kam kurit ajuni saiban kur prasaja ad such to god such happy such non kosi such. That's the root. That's the root of everything of all of Sikh. Every practice in Sikh Dharma, everything, every shabbat, every body, every rahat, every seva, everything, everything is so that you can get to the experience of the Mul Mantra. Then Japji Sahib explains the Mul Mantra. And Japji Sahib has these 40 steps to your own liberation, to being liberated while you're alive. And then he said, the entire Siddhi Guru Granth Sahib is the explanation of Japji. Okay, so if there's something you don't understand in Japji, there's so many shabbats and there's so many songs and so everything and, and from people from not just the Sikh tradition, from the Hindu tradition, from the Sufi tradition, from sons, from because because Guru Nanak wasn't talking a personal truth. And he wasn't talking a social truth. He wasn't talking a circumstantial truth. He was talking universal truth. And he was talking it in a way that said, look, 
Universal truth is universal truth no matter how you package it. The question is, can you recognize it or not? The question is, can you hear it or not? So the Siddha Guru Granth Sahib is this amazing collection of divine teaching songs that will explain Japji and that, um, and that come from a, a range of traditions. Okay? So here we've got the Mol Mantra. Japji Sahib explains the Mol Mantra. The Siddha Guru Granth Sahib explains Japji Sahib. And then what the Sri Singh Sahib said to me, which I loved, which I've always like, wow. He said, and the Khalsa community explains the city good run song. So that the end goal, sort of, if you want to say it's a goal, isn't that you've read it or understood it. The end is that you live it in your being, that you become the embodiment of that wisdom. And in your lived action, from your personal understanding of what the good is teaching, that creates a community of the, what we say, the Khalsa, what we say, those who live by the purity of their own spirit, the purity of their own truth. Okay, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So back to Guru Nanak. So Guru Nanak, you know, sang this song. And then he started wandering around everywhere teaching, and he had his faithful minstrel Mardana, who was a Muslim, accompanying him. And he loved to freak people out, Guru Nanak. He walked around dressed half as a Muslim and half Hindu. Okay, can you imagine? You're living in a society where you're either Hindu or Muslim. And here's this guy walking around and he's like half and half. And it's like, what are you? And he's like, what are you? You know, there is no Hindu, there is no Muslim. We're all mothers and sisters. Uh, there's a story about how he went to a river. Does, you guys, how many people have heard the story of the river and the ancestors? Yeah, okay, it's one of my favorite. I just love them, because I just picture this. I mean, they, they write these stories in these very formal language, but this guy had such a sense of humor. I mean, you just had to imagine. Here are all these people in the river, and they're worshiping their ancestors by throwing water. I don't know if it can remember east or west. I can't remember. My sense of direction is very good. But they're throwing water to the ancestors, right? Could you not have asked them, what are you doing? Oh, we're giving water to our ancestors, you know? We have to give them the water, you know, so they, you know. Gunanak says, oh. So he gets in the river, and he starts throwing water in the opposite direction of what they're doing. They're just looking, looking at this guy dressed half Hindu, half Muslim, throwing water in the opposite direction of what they're doing, and they're finally like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm watering my fields. And they're, they're like, what? You're, you're, the water can't reach your fields. The, the water you're throwing in the air isn't going to reach your fields. It's like, yeah, if the water can't reach my fields, what makes you think the water can reach your ancestors? So he was really into confronting people's kind of ritual ideas about what it meant to be spiritual. And he, he, he gives us so many lessons that says, look, it's about the reality. Your reality, as your experience as a human being is all you need to be spiritual. You just got to get into yourself and into your own experience. You don't need ritual. You don't need superstition. Uh, and, and the other thing is that he was in a space where these words, you know, he would sit, he and Mardana would uh, travel, and then he would ask Mardana to start playing the music, and he would say, Bonnie is coming to me. Bonnie is coming to me. So in his experience, these songs, he didn't write them. He heard them. He heard them in the heavens. And he just sang them and brought them to the earth. So that the Shabbat, the body of the Guru, is not something that came from Guru Nanak. It's something that came through Guru Nanak. But it's something that he actually heard and would kind of, like God was the composer and he was just writing down the music. Right? And a lot of composers will say that they hear things and they're just recording it. And for Guru Nanak, that was his experience. That wisdom was already there. It was already there in the cosmos and he was just listening. Another one of my favorite stories about Guru Nanak is that he, um, there was one day he was in teaching in a certain town, and the town got raided by some nearby king. And everybody in the town was put in prison. And they were forced to grind corn. So Guru Nanak is like, no problem. So he just has Mardana play as Rebek, and he just sings. They're doing Satkartar, I think was the chant they did. Um, from what I understand, they sang Satkartar. And they're just sitting there, and they're singing. And the corn is grinding itself. It's doing it itself. Just from the sound of the song, the corn is grinding itself. We 
you can imagine that the guards in the prison were a little freaked out by this. <laughs> you know, they think they're these mighty conquerors, and all of a sudden, here's this guy, half Muslim, half Muslim, who, who the heck is he? And he's singing a song, and the corn is grinding itself. And you know, this has got to have, like, if you're a guard, and you're trying to keep a bunch of prisoners, something like that is not going to impact the morale of the prisoners the way you want it to, you know? Like, but prisoners are supposed to be beat down and slaves, and all of a sudden, they're like, here's this guy, and the corn's grinding itself, and prisoners are getting into it. What's this guy doing? So the guards go and they tell the king. And the king's like, uh-oh, I have, I, I locked up a holy man. I'm in trouble. So the king calls Guru Nanak in and wants to know, you know, what, it, what, it, what, are, what are you all about? You know, so Guru Nanak starts teaching him and, you know, and the king pulls out, you know, the, the, the equivalent of a bong in that day and age, you know. Uh, it's like, okay, well, you have your experience of the nectar and the bliss. Well, here's my experience. You want to share my experience? And Guru Nanak's like, no, what I got is good enough. So he, like, turns down the king. He's like, okay. And then finally he says to Guru Nanak, so, so what can I, you know, what can I do for you? What do you, what do you want? Guru Nanak's like, free all the prisoners. So even in that moment in prison, he was in such a space of love and freedom in his own consciousness that he just kept singing these divine songs that he heard, and the corn ground itself, and eventually the king let the prisoners go. And my own experience with Gurbani is that when you really get into singing these, these words and these songs, there is a power in them that starts to heal what is wounded and starts to balance what is out of balance, both within yourself and within your environment. It isn't that the Gurus gave us a philosophy, though there, there is definitely beautiful ideas in Gurbani. But what the Gurus ultimately gave us was a power, was a sound, a, a power of sound. And the very sound of it starts to change your brain, starts to change your body, starts to heal you, starts to shift and balance you. So in, in, that's why it was so important you know, to start off the course with everybody listening to the sound of Japji. Because that, just that experience of us listening and singing to it is already healing all of us and already bringing something that's out of balance into balance. And, uh, you know, and we'll, we'll get more of that experience over the next day and a half. So, all of that said, so those are my few favorite stories about the rebel, the man, the guru, guru Nanak, who I personally think was very cool. And there's more stories like that.